I'm Nicholas Kristof. I recently traveled to Myanmar, a Southeast Asian country moving from dictatorship to democracy. But something tragic is unfolding here as the world stands by. Hundreds of thousands of people confined to modern-day concentration camps, and inside, a daily struggle between life and death. We have a woman who is in labor with a breech delivery. One foot has emerged. People like Munora Begum are locked up here because of their ethnicity. They live behind fences and police checkpoints. They can't leave, and doctors aren't allowed in, even to save their lives. Minora has been in labor for 20 hours. Her life is at risk. So is the baby's. Is she going to die? Can you explain to them that we're journalists from the United States? We're trying to understand the situation with the Rohingya? These are the Rohingya people, a small Muslim minority originally from Bangladesh. For generations, they lived beside their Buddhist neighbors with manageable tensions. But all of that changed. Now they're nowhere to be found in the main city, just outside of the camps. This may look like a normal city market, but it's not. Here there used to be Muslim traders and businesses. Today there are none. This city has been ethnically cleansed. In 2012, Myanmar's new democracy unleashed long-simmering racial hatred. Violent clashes killed scores of Muslims and destroyed nearly 100,000 homes. Now the government's making that terrible situation worse. The authorities fenced the Muslims into closed camps, leaving them to rot. They can go anywhere within the camps, but they can't leave. It's like we are like being in the, in the jail. We are like in the the bats in the cage, like in the ghetto. As a result, they're deprived of jobs and schools. But the most urgent issue is medical care. 105? This child has a fever of 105 degrees. Without doctors, this baby's life now hinges on a wet washcloth. A Buddhist mob broke this man's arm he couldn't get medical care, so he's now maimed for life. In March, the situation deteriorated even further. Buddhists attacked the offices of humanitarian groups, and the government expelled the aid group Doctors Without Borders. That deprived a million Muslims of their only real source of medical care. In my week in the camps, I found only one small team of international aid workers, and they were operating undercover. Is it fair to think of this as a concentration camp? I would say that it is. These people are completely shut off from the outside world, and the only health care or aid of any kind is what is brought in to them. Most of the time, there is little to none. Thousands of Rohingya Muslims have risked their lives fleeing by boat to neighboring Thailand. Many of the relatives they left behind are now planning their own escapes through the camp's only remaining link to the outside world. But the problems here go so far beyond the camps. I also visited rural Muslim villages where much of the violence took place. Like the camps, they're sealed off and guarded by Buddhist police who claim they're just keeping the peace. These Muslims are so isolated that when we arrived, a farmer handed us a letter written in broken English. Because people at Cherohan, just people are problem. It was a desperate plea for help. What is the biggest difficulty of people here in this village? And are you afraid? Is it possible that after we leave, that you will be punished for talking to us? 
During our conversation, the police hovered just outside. So why is the government doing this? I went to see a senior state official to ask about the Rohingya. I was shocked by his response. How can there be progress for the Rohingya when officials deny their very existence? In the camp the other day, we saw a young woman who desperately needed a C-section. This hatred is fueled by the most unlikely leaders, Buddhist monks, like the enormously popular Uratu, who spreads hatred on Facebook. Pop into even a remote monastery, and you can find echoes of Waratu. Just a mile or two from here, there were about 60 people, including a number of very young children who were hacked to death. Do you have a responsibility as a religious leader to try to prevent this from happening again? I wanted to understand the Buddhist perspective. Ordinary Buddhists, like these guys, they see the Rohingya as violent, illegal immigrants who will take over. And democracy arguably makes the situation worse, as politicians compete for voters like these on nationalistic grounds. Frankly, that's a ridiculous fear. Myanmar is 90% Buddhist. My fear is that this poison could bring down the whole country. If you saw a Muslim boy your age, what would you do? How would you react? Back in the camps, Muslims with medical crises have nowhere to turn but to these makeshift pharmacies. That's where I found Manura, the pregnant woman who was struggling to deliver her baby. I couldn't stand by and watch her die. Our van took her from the pharmacy to one of the few government clinics in the camps. But of course, nobody was there. We called for a nurse, but when she finally showed up, she said she wasn't up to the task. Is she gonna die? She will die. It seems to me that what is killing her is not just the breech birth, but it is also the government policy of not allowing more doctors here. With no help to be found, Menorah went home. Miraculously, she survived. Her baby girl did not. There are two Nobel Peace Prize winners who I wish could have been with me in these camps. First, there's the great democracy fighter, Aung San Suu Kyi. She's been quiet on this issue. She wants to be president, so it would be politically risky to speak up for the reviled Rohingya. But come on, she's already stood up to generals. I wish she would rediscover her courage. Then there's President Obama. I wish he would speak up forcefully for a million people denied basic human rights like medical care. On my last day in the camps, I stumbled upon a funeral. 
This 35-year-old man suffered from tuberculosis, a treatable disease if you can get medicine. But when the government banned aid groups, he was left to die, leaving behind a wife and five children. One more unnecessary grave in a camp full of unnecessary graves. 